Hey there. Welcome back to another episode of the Collecting Keys Friday Focus. If you're new here, these are the episodes of where Mike or I dive into a specific topic. We like to do Friday Focus case study episodes with the folks that are in our scale community where we do a deep dive on their wins and losses and what those look like. Sometimes we like to go on a rant. I'm Dan Austin and I will be your host today. And I want to talk about an age old discussion. And that is, does size matter? And this might not be what you're thinking when I say size matter or does size matter. I'm talking about the number of units. And when I say units, it's not what you're thinking. I'm talking about the actual number of units that you have in a single building, meaning should you go and search for larger properties, 20, 30, 40, 100 units, or should you kind of dabble in the single family duplex, triplex, quad, six, maybe up to 15 units, 16 units, something like that. Because I don't believe that there's a right or wrong answer, but there are certainly pros and cons to each. I know people that specifically look for anything that is like a 10 plex and below. I know people that are looking for a hundred and above. I know people that just dabble in single family homes. And partially this will depend on where you're marketing because some markets they're really known for their duplexes. Some markets are really known for their eight units, or maybe there's some markets that have larger, older, you know, 48, 60 unit buildings. So that, that'll play a role into it. Location and what your market will bear and culturally what people, what their living style is. And that also might be associated with income levels and socioeconomic statuses. You know, some areas, it's probably more common to live in townhomes where, you know, in our area, it's less common. We have a lot of single family homes and larger apartments. And then we're spackled with some duplexes here and some sixplexes here. And, but we're, I would say for the most part, my town where I market has a lot of single families and uh, not as much small multifamily. But when you're talking about this discussion, there's a few things you want to really look at and measure. One of them is going to be management. One of them will be return on your investment. And one of them really should be your growth strategy and where you're at in your overall investing set strategy. So diving into why you might want to go small and pick these smaller buildings. Let's talk like duplex and quads and sixplexes and stuff like that. The advantage of these are they're much more liquid. You can sell a duplex, right? A lot faster than you can like a 48 unit or 60 unit apartment. The underwriting on it's simple. And the cool thing about it is, is there's a lot less sophisticated buyers buying small multi and sellers selling small multifamily. What you'll find it often in these markets is they're either older retiring landlords that just, they bought these things 30 years ago. And now they're ready to offload them. Their P and L is on a piece of paper and they collect their rent checks literally through checks or cash through a mailbox that's maybe on site this old school landlord that just is like, I want to sell it. Here's my price, take it or leave it. You also have some people that, that got into it, you know, some mom and pops that maybe aren't the old tired landlord, but they got into it and they didn't know what they're getting into and they just want to offload it and sell it. Same thing goes on the buy side is there's a lot of people that are hungry to learn how to house hack. They want to move into one side and rent the other out, or they have some extra income. Maybe they're they're a high income earning family and they heard real estate's great. So they, they don't really have the grit and their W-2 job is paying them more than enough. So they don't want to grind it out and do the hustle, but they're, so they're willing to pay for some of that, but through a lower ROI. I'll give you an example. You know, in our market, we, we can have like nicer duplexes, say it's three, three bed, two baths, side by side. You could easily, if it's nice, sell it for 800 to $900,000. Each side maybe rents for 23, 2400 on the high end. To a lot of the folks that are listening, that might not sound good, but to some, it sounds really good because they can go and park some money and they can cash flow some, a little bit, a few hundred bucks, depending on how much they park, but they're going to get the appreciation, the depreciation and the, the, the tax benefits essentially. And then just a place to park some money that's maybe diversifying out of the stock market. So at that level, you'll see that a lot more, which makes it easier to sell, easier to sell for a profit. And back to the sophistication of the buyers and sellers, it's easier to find these properties and get them at a discount. The other thing about them is that you can get, when you're buying them, you're likely going to have a larger percent ownership. You're probably going to own 100% of it. 
um, as opposed to some of these larger units where you may have to bring in limited partners or other partners to joint venture it to buy them. Just because the dollar amounts are generally a little bit lower, I like to look at some of our, our properties. Mike and I 100% own all of our properties. The biggest we've owned personally is like an eightplex, which we actually just sold this year for a decent profit. And we have duplexes and, and sixplexes and single family homes. And for us, we own 100% of it, you know, 50-50 for each of us. And we were able to get into these by buying them from less sophisticated sellers. I think about actually, now that I think about most of our multifamily we bought was from baby boomer age people that wanted to sell. They didn't want, they were just tired of dealing with tenants. We had one guy that just wanted to move to Tucson. It was the dead of the winter. He's like, I know it's worth more. But if you will really willing to do this, let's move it right now. We did that. We had some a duplex from an old guy that was house hacking it that didn't want to do it anymore. We bought one from an older gentleman, a duplex that he just didn't. His wife was getting sick. He was in his 80s. He just didn't want to deal with it. He wanted the cash in his bank account in case something happened. So we were able to go and help these people because most of these properties we bought were you know disrepair because they didn't take care of them for the last 20 years. And so they needed to be sold you know at a discount. So with that discount, we were able to come in, put some elbow grease in it and scale to, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity in some of these properties. And it worked out well. And we're actually looking at, because our return on equity is so low in some of them, looking at exiting and we're able, we're able to exit because they're nice properties at a higher price point than what we bought or another, you know, investor like us would pay for it because there is such a glut of people looking to buy the small multis. The challenges with smaller buildings or more of smaller buildings is you got more roofs, you got more yards, more parking and more tenant issues. A lot of times, especially if you're in like a C class or, you know, B minus, you have not as quality tenants that are seeking out mom and pop landlords in smaller multifamilies. And you would typically maybe see where you have higher underwriting standard and credit standards in like a 148 unit apartment building where it's all commercialized. It's like you either fit in the box or you don't. There's some of those tenants that don't fit in those box, seek out other mom and pop tenants that they can sometimes take advantage of. Not always, but sometimes. But so the property management can be much more challenging. And you might find a great property manager you love and they do really good for you, but then you, you buy some more units on the other side of town or in the town next door and they, your property manager says, sure, I'd love to manage those. But that little bit of distance, that little bit of difference in neighborhoods and demographics makes it so that that is not as high quality as what you were seeing with your other units and you may have to go and seek it out and find new property managers. So now you have potentially multiple property managers managing your assets. So it just becomes a little bit harder, um, but I will say there is definitely opportunity for higher return on investment and higher growth because of the reasons I listed as far as it being a much more liquid asset that can be sold to a larger array of buyers. But it comes with problems and scale is one of those problems It's very hard due to the property management issues and also more roofs, more yards, more parking lots, more things that can happen, more exposure can happen when you're doing that. And, you know, Mike and I, like I said, we have a portfolio of smaller assets. It's extremely hard to scale. And sometimes I'm like, I should sell all of this and put it into a bigger property, one big property. There's some huge advantages. And so talking about why you might want to invest in these bigger buildings, and, and we'll even say something around 20 units or bigger, it, we will consider that bigger. You really, what you're going to do, if you get big enough, you're going to have on-site management. So you're going to have somebody on staff all the time. The building will pay for itself. The buildings, you're typically underwriting them to cover all those expenses that come with just the, it's more of a business. You buy it with a business plan, an intended business plan. Sellers are more sophisticated. So they're going to have hopefully better documentation, not all the time, but it's like, hey, you've got lawn care, you've got parking lot, plowing, you have all these things. Those things are kind of just standard and basic as compared to small multifamily. Some owners, like I have properties like, oh yeah, tenant in, in unit three, they, they plow the driveway when they're not drunk, right? And so it's like, that's not always the best from a management scale standpoint. Where with bigger buildings, you typically can have that built in. I will also say like, it's just a more robust business opportunity, uh, but it, it comes with, it comes with some downsides. Uh, but I do like that there's usually one roof for, you know, more units, less maintenance issues that could just spring up because like I said, you're coming in with a more robust business plan. But the trade-off with that is you're, you know, you're relinquishing some of your return on investment. Typically, again, going back to the more sophisticated buyers and sellers, they're not going to 
usually let their property get into disrepair to where the business plan is falling apart, typically, not always. And buyers are going to be expecting a deep discount if you're not operating it very well. And those larger units are all based on cap rates. And so, you know, whatever the market's doing, if you can squeeze a little bit more net operating income out by operating it more efficiently, it's going to boost the value. And that's what everybody's trying to do in the larger multifamily game. It's like, how do we increase not just cash flow, but net operating income by reducing expenses and increasing revenue? That's what it's all about. That's the name of the game. And then selling at an opportunistic point where cap rates are compressing, like what we saw the last several years when interest rates were zero. That really is the name of the game. Tough parts about um, these bigger buildings is typically you're gonna have less ownership unless you have cash and you're able to come in and buy these or you're able to buy the asset yourself. It's harder, you're less likely to just go and get a bridge loan or burr these things because the more units you have, the longer it takes. It might be a three to five year stabilization period, right, before you can refinance and get money out. So a lot of folks, they raise capital or they bring in joint venture partners who are all willing to split a piece of the deal. And then you're not tying up all of your capital, getting a really low return on investment until that three to five year cash out refinance standpoint or sale or exit, however you choose to, to build out your business plan. And for a lot of folks, for me included, I've always kind of strayed away from that because I kind of like owning 100% of my assets and getting a higher ROI and putting sweat equity into things, bigger buildings, you still can do all that stuff. It's just less common and the deals are less, less common to happen where, you know, if you go pull up Zillow, you can guarantee you're going to go and find a bunch of duplexes, triplexes, sixplexes bouncing around all over your market for sale. How many 20, 30, 40, 100 units are you going to go see? Well, you're not going to find them on Zillow. You're going to go look at Crexy or something like that. And they're going to be just stupid, wrong deals, right? You're not even going to be able to see how, how a deal like that would work. So they're fewer and far in between. They rely much more on broker relationships to buy. So you might, if you're really pushing, be able to do one deal a year, where if, if you're doing like marketing direct to sellers and looking for those tired landlords, those distressed sellers, you could buy several duplexes, several quads, you know, you could throw it. I mean, for a while, Mike and I went on a buying spree, you know, buying a single family home here, buy a duplex next month, buy a sixplex next month, eightplex the following month, right? So we've definitely gone through those cycles and one person might say, well, yeah, but one bigger deal a year is better than a bunch of small deals. Absolutely, if that's your goal, but typically, I'll go back to the beginning of the conversation, putting sweat equity into these smaller buildings will typically have a higher ROI because of the, the sellers on the one side and the buyers on the other side of you. So really to, to sum it up, there's not like a right or wrong answer. And I recommend people write out, what are your goals with real estate? Do you want it to be easy? Well, you're going to have to probably give up some return on investment the easier you want it. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I love easy. That's what I said some days. I'm like, I think I might sell all of my single families and duplexes and stuff and just go and reinvest in one large deal. And when that one large deal, I can squeeze out the ROI I want on that, go ahead and roll that in, 1031 that into another larger deal and keep growing it that way. Maybe look at some commercial assets, which I've been doing this year as well, um, because I'm at a point to where I want easy. If you're at a growth phase where you're willing to grind it out and, and push more, more power to you, go do it. And I'm not saying I'm done with that phase. I'm just right now putting that on pause because I've done so much of the last, well, I don't know, eight years now. So it's definitely up to you and what your goals are, but keep in mind, what are your growth goals? What is your return on investment? When I say that, what are your cash on cash requirements? What is your IRR requirement, your internal rate of return, which is the time value of your return on money, not just how much you're earning, but when you're earning it. And look at the management piece, the time piece, and that will really help you determine uh, which direction you want to go, at least give you a starting point, because now you have a vision for what you want it to look like. And then you can start running deals, deal analysis on things and looking at these smaller multis versus the larger multifamily and seeing what they come up with. So I will stop rambling on. If you have more questions, I would love to chat about this. Hit me up on Instagram at Investor Man Dan. DM me, does size matter? And <laughs> And I'll laugh. I think it'll be funny. Uh, but then I'll be happy to uh, chat with you about this. Or if you have questions on deals you're looking at and like want my opinion on them, happy to take a look at them. I love the engagement. And also, if you have some opinions on this, let me know because I'm not saying that mine's the right opinion. If I glossed over somewhere and didn't talk about something just because I don't have all the time in the world to talk about it here, let me know. I'll be happy to, to share more of that 
in a later episode as well or out on like an Instagram reel or TikTok. So maybe I'll do a TikTok for you. But with further ado, have a great weekend. I hope you enjoyed this episode and uh, see y'all next week.